and of course our budget for 2022. And we need to have, I believe it's 51 people at the meeting in order to vote on anything. So if we don't have that many people, we can't vote and there'll be no budget, which is kind of a problem. So please, please make every effort to be here next week after worship and stay and be part of that. It doesn't usually last all that long, so um, please stay. I'm doing something new this year, and I'm still going to do it, even though I'm still kind of recovering from all of my stuff. But uh, there's a tradition in the church called the blessing and chalking of homes, and it's something that's done during the season of Epiphany, which is where we are right now. And it's a way to for me to come to your home, and we do a little rite of um, blessing, and I write with actual chalk on the outside of your drawer frame uh, to bless your home for the year. So if you'd like me to come and do that for you, there is a sign-up sheet on the Welcome Center with certain dates that I can come by. So please sign up so that I can bless your home for the year. Um, and finally, WELCA, the Women of the ELCA, is meeting tomorrow at 11.30 uh, for their monthly meeting. And there's a change in the program, though. Lori Burnham from Monument Health will be here to talk about Monument Health's volunteer program. So please come. All the women are invited to come and be part of that. I know both of them. They always have fun in their meetings, so come and be part of that. And now, I invite you to stand as you are able as we begin worship in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus 
Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
John chapter 2. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus, Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rite of purification, each one holding twenty or thirty gallons. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had been, become wine, he did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone who serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. <clears throat> but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Word of God, word of life. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Just a little aside, um, everything I do right now is making me exhausted, so I'm just going to sit on my stool here a little bit, so bear with me. If you see me sitting on my stool, it's just because I'm tired. So. But, grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, again. So, this story of the wedding feast in Cana is one of my favorite miracle stories. And I think it's because it doesn't fit with any of the other miracle stories, especially in John's Gospel. This one seems pretty frivolous. The rest, it does. I mean, providing wine at a wedding is not exactly an emergency, right? Because the other, all the other gospel, all the other miracles in the gospel are either life-threatening or, I mean, there's demon possession and illness and hunger and things that are really serious crisis for people. Jesus was all about taking care of people and stepping in when to relieve suffering. Again, you know, to restore life and health and wholeness to the individual person, but also to the whole community. His, was, his miracles were more far-reaching and involved usually some kind of crisis, right? But this miracle of the wine doesn't involve any of that. Again, it seems pretty frivolous. For Jesus to turn water into wine just to keep the party going, right? It doesn't seem to fit. But if I imagine if it was our wedding or our children's wedding and the bar ran out of wine or alcohol, we'd be pretty upset, wouldn't we? Right? But it wouldn't, I mean, it would be an embarrassment. You know, to run out of wine, especially in that culture, that was a huge deal to run out of wine for the wedding. But I want to put this in perspective because weddings back in Jesus' time were very different than they are now. So now a wedding reception would last a couple of hours, maybe, and then that would be it. In Jesus' time, wedding celebrations lasted at least seven days. Could you imagine? That's a lot. And imagine having to supply wine for all those people for that many days. You need a lot of wine. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> so imagine this wedding celebration. Let's say it's maybe the third day of the seven days, and they've already run out of wine. That would cause a huge amount of embarrassment to the, the family because the, the family was expected to provide for their guests, right? And how you are perceived in that culture makes such a huge difference in your community. So you lose face in your community, and your standing in the community would be would drop dramatically because of something like this. 
So maybe it was more of a crisis than we think. Maybe not, I don't know. But this is also more than just a simple story of a miracle of Jesus. The wedding banquet in the Old Testament is used often as a symbol of the restoration of Israel. Of, and the wine is frequently used as a symbol of the joy and the celebration uh, associated with salvation through God. So the wedding banquet and the wine are big symbols for the Jewish faith. The abundance of wine, not just a little bit, but the abundance of wine, is a symbol of the abundance of joy that awaits not only Israel and their salvation, but all people. So running out of wine is not a good symbol for the Jewish faith and for the people in this situation. It, it poses a, a bad picture of God's salvation to run out of this wine. One commentary I read this week says, Jesus' extravagant miracle of changing the water into wine is a sign that in him, life, joy, and salvation have arrived. <clears throat> so remember, this is John's Gospel. In the beginning of John's Gospel, we're told, in him was life, and that life was the light of all people. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And later, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. What does abundant life even mean? To me, abundant life is about knowing and being known by this one who all through all life has come into being through him. And you and I are known by this Savior, this light of the world. That's what abundant life is. It's about being in relationship with this one who is the light and life of all people. It means finding joy through him in our everyday lives. Not just in those big, huge moments of life, but every day. Now, of course, we all know that this abundant life we have in Jesus doesn't mean we'll never experience suffering or grief or pain or struggle, right? We know that. Doesn't mean that bad things will never happen. I can speak to that pretty well lately, <laughs> right? Bad things happen. We suffer, we struggle, um, things happen unexpectedly. But this abundant life, in spite of all that, it does mean that even when we go through those difficult times, we have Jesus' light and life and grace with us to hold us up when we can't stand on our own and to give us joy even in the midst of our struggles. Now, I don't know about you, but I sometimes find joy hard to find when I'm struggling and suffering. I have to tell you, when I was laying in the bed in ICU, not able to move because I went to the cath lab, joy was the farthest thing from my mind, okay? I was angry, I was depressed, I was pretty mad at God for a little bit there. But, I thought, how am I going to find joy in the midst of all this? when I felt like I was surrounded by darkness. But I was thankful for all the nurses and the doctors and the CNAs and all the staff at the hospital who were so caring and took such good care of me. And cared that they, whether they actually cared or not, they acted like they cared so deeply about how I was doing and made sure that I did not remaining depressed and sad. And I was so thankful for all of you because I knew you were holding me and my family in prayer. So maybe that wasn't joyful celebration, but it was thankfulness and it brought me hope. How often when we're in darkness do we need hope? 
And I think, for me, hope leads to joy. So even in those dark times, we can find that. Because we know that not only is God with us, but we know we have each other as well. So this abundant life, another commentary says, this abundant life means that in Christ we are joined to the source of true life. Life that is rich and full and eternal. Life that neither sorrow nor suffering nor death can destroy. How can we not find joy in that? Another pastor said, he heard, he once heard a speaker criticize the Lutheran church by saying, we have all the right words to a party, but we haven't learned how to pull it off yet. Because <laughs> we have God's grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and all of that, right? But he says, seldom do our worship services feel like wedding celebrations where there are 180 gallons of wine flowing. Right? I mean, it's true. He says, maybe I'll just talk about 180 gallons of wine can encourage us to be more celebrative and joyful in our receiving and sharing of God's grace. And he says, at the same time, I often wonder what Sunday services would be like if we did put in as much time, effort, and money as we do for weddings. Imagine that. Maybe we need to redo the budget. <laughs> but again, this abundant life that Jesus offers us is filled with Jesus' light and love and grace. Nothing can take that away. Nothing. Not suffering, not grief, not even death. Again, Jesus is the light shining in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. How can we not be filled with joy and celebration, especially when we come to worship this God who is the source of all life and light, and is the light of the whole world? Let's imagine worship as a wedding feast filled with the abundance of wine and joy, and especially the presence of Jesus, who is our light and our salvation. Jesus is the light for all people. And his light and his life live in each and every one of you. Let Jesus' light and life and joy fill you and radiate from you, filling the world with light and joy.
I invite you to stand as you are able as we pray for the church and all those in need. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance. So we may bold, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. By your Spirit, activate within your church gifts of faith, healing, and prophecy. Unite those who profess your name across congregations, denominations, and geographic boundaries. Open our hearts to recognize and celebrate surprising miracles. God of grace, hear our prayers. Your creation reflects your generosity. Bless farmers, migrant farm workers, orchard keepers, ranchers, and all who tend the abundance of the land. Protect food and water sources from destruction, that all may eat and drink and be satisfied. Protect all those in the path of this winter storm and in the path of potential tsunami on the West Coast. Help all people find a safe and warm place to stay. God of grace, hear our prayer. By your Spirit, grant wisdom, knowledge, and discernment to those who hold leadership positions at any level. Direct policymakers toward compassionate decisions that build up safe and just communities. Lead all authorities in seeking and serving the common good. God of grace, hear our prayer. As Jesus provided generously in a moment of need, provide abundantly for all who are hungry or thirsty, all seeking shelter, and all who seek peace. Send your strength to the people who have been held hostage at the synagogue in Texas. We are thankful also for their safe rescue and for all law enforcement who made that possible. Provide your generous gifts of healing for those in need this day, especially those we need aloud or in our hearts. God of grace, you see us for who we are, and you delight in us. Embrace those struggling with self-worth, wrestling with self-identity, or facing significant life transitions. Remind us that nothing can separate us from your love, and fill us with such a sense of your life and light living through us, that we joyfully share your love and grace wherever we go. God of grace, hear our prayer. You bless us through the spiritual gifts of the saints who have gone before us. We give thanks for the life of Martin Luther King Jr. and all who have modeled the way of courageous faith. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we receive our gifts of offering and comments. <laughs>
join in the offering prayer. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us your beings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table, nourish us with this heavenly food, and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ our Lord. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Now, gather into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he makes us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For communion this morning, you will be ushered forward to, we'll have two stations, and you'll receive the wafer, and I invite you to eat the wafer, and then you'll receive a cup of either white wine or purple grape juice, and when you're done drinking that, you can drop it in one of the baskets on your, <coughs> on the baskets on the way back to your pew. We also have gluten-free available, so if you'd like that, just let us know when you come forward. Now come, for all is now ready, and all are welcome. No matter where you come from or where you are on your faith journey now, know that you are always welcome at Christ's table. You may be seated. <laughs>
invite you to stand as you are able. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Now receive the blessing. God who leads you in the pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you, and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in, now and forever. Amen. Amen.